Good afternoon uh, and welcome to this session which is talking about sustainable technologies which obviously play a very, very important role when we think about going towards bioeconomy or even more so when going towards circular economy. So my name is Marita Niemela and I'm coming from uh, where I am the vice president of, of strategy. And for those of you who don't know Valmet, I might say that we are one of the leading suppliers of technology for the pulp, paper and power industries globally. So the, the, the topic of sustainable future and sustainable development and technology is very close to us. So therefore, I feel really, really privileged to be here today chairing this, this session where we have three distinguished speakers and panelists coming from the industry. I would first like to introduce Heidi Fagerholm, the CTO Management Board Member of Chemira. He Heidi, please. So Heidi has since uh, 2011 been working as a Chief Technology Officer at Chemira. She joined um, uh, in, in November 2010 and since January she is the CTO of the company and responsible for developing Chemira's research and development operations in Espo, Finland, Atlanta, Georgia and Shanghai, China. She is also a member of Chemira's management team. So we will hear now how Chemira looks into uh, the role of uh, sustainable governance as, as part of the corporate function. Thank you, Marita, for your kind invitation, uh, introduction. And, and ladies and gentlemen, and thanks for the organizing committee for the invitation to and the given the possibility to speak here about um, how Chemira sees the, let's say, sustainable technologies. We see it actually uh, a part of the corporate responsibility. So it's a part of a bigger picture. I will actually talk more about the corporate responsibility, uh, which is the way we do business, the way we um, organize our raw materials, being a chemicals company, uh, the way we treat our employees, uh, it's about how we uh, manufacture our products. Uh, a very large part of it is sustainable products and solutions. And that is, of course, how do we innovate? How do we create the new uh, uh, products and solutions? And what type of uh, role does the sustainability play in there? And of course, uh, the last but not the least is the responsibility towards the communities where we operate. So that's part of the social responsibility. And we make chemicals products that are used in order to save raw materials, energy, uh, water, and especially for, for cleaning, let's say, wastewaters. So you see here on the right hand side a chart which is showing that how much how many millions of cubic meters of water is actually cleaned annually with our products. All in all uh, when we think about the corporate responsibility again where the sustainability is, a, is an essential part of it there is uh, very many guidelines that actually direct our behavior in that field. And um, we follow the OECD guidelines for multinational enterprises. There's um, a United Nations approach about the global compact uh, and the principles are followed. So part of that also determines the field of um, and our environment where we play. Uh, chemical industry has also um, so to say, a more voluntary approach, uh, which is called responsible care. And that is an initiative which is driving the continuous improvement in health, safety and environmental performance. So we want our products to be safe to use, safe for our employees when they are being manufactured. We want to trust on reliable raw material sources. And we want also to support our customers to contribute to the sustainable development. So our products are helping our customers throughout the value chain to decrease the use of energy, to decrease the use of water or reuse of water, and to decrease 
the, uh, decrease the use of, of raw materials. Uh, our responsibility, let's say, focus areas and targets, and this is a very busy slide, but actually you see that it covers the whole value chain, all from the supply of the raw materials to the manufacturing when we make our chemical products, uh, the persons who are making them and using them, so our employees, all the way to sustainable products and solutions, and then finally the responsibility towards the communities where we operate. Uh, we publish annually also, um, let's say, targets where we want to be active in and where we want to improve our operations. And we also, in our innovation activities, today our target is that every new product that is being developed needs to be more sustainable, uh, defined with certain criteria, than the current offering on the market. And uh, next year we will start actually quantifying the benefits of that. So that is how we see the, let's say, sustainability as in, in the big picture. And we also promote that our employees participate in the local community to initiate, let's say, um, beneficial activities or, or um, actions towards the community. So we want to be active in that respect as well. Regarding the technologies, so we operate actually, we provide chemicals for di three different, um, let's say, uh, business segments. The biggest one being pulp and paper industry. And we, uh, our aim is that our let's say, by innovating the next generation, for example, sizing products or strength or wet end process chemicals, we want to help our customers to save in terms of uh, raw materials. So by adding small amounts of chemicals, you can actually save in, in um, let's say, in using our usage of, of other raw materials. So more properties, more functions for less, with less materials. We want to support our customers to improve the process efficiency and runnability of their machines. Meaning that, uh, again, by using certain chemicals, the total ownership of the uh, paper manufacturing process will be more sustainable. It will help uh, the customer to save energy or water or raw materials. And at the same time, we're also, also um, driving for improved quality of the final end products. So the sustainability in our operations is seen as, let's say, it's part of our operations, but also it's part of our business concept where we help our customers to become more sustainable. A second area where we are, are very active and, and uh, uh, business, have business in is the oil and mining business. There we want to provide again to our customers um, chemical solutions that are more sustainable than the current offering on the market. Uh, want to better recover uh, some of the, let's say, valuable ores. So better separations of the valuable ores from the less valuable ones. This is especially important with the declining, ever declining ore qualities in the world. Secondly, um, improving and making more efficient of the pumping processes of oil. We realize that we're still going to be uh, despite the, the, um, the increasing use of, of let's say, bioenergies, we're still going to be dependent on the oil industry for quite some while. And we want to provide the industry solutions, chemical solutions, that will help to pump the oil with less energy and with more sustainable, let's say, chemistries. 
And that is um, one of our very important innovation-based targets also. And the third business area where we are active is the municipal and industrial. Municipal meaning the cleaning of wastewater. So municipal industrial wastewater needs to be cleaned. And we also here want to promote the reuse of water. Which of course from the psychological point of view is somewhat, let's say, challenging still. Because not all of us feel so fine being drinking water that has been drinked already a couple of times. But anyway, we want to be uh, a good and reliable partner in that sense. Uh, we use a lot of, let's say, um, um, waste materials from other industries to manufacture, for example, coagulant, which is the basic chemical used for wastewater, for municipal wastewater. So separation of solid and liquid. And there we use waste streams, side streams of other um, chemical industries and use that as raw material for manufacturing our chemicals. We have also uh, built a plant next to a, um, let's say, a buyer plant in um, Germany, collaborating with them using their side streams to, as our raw material base. Uh, one of the targets also is to provide chemicals that will improve process efficiency in industrial biogas manufacturing or production. So again, better separation of water and solid and energy, let's say savings. So this is our approach, how Kemira sees the, let's say, sustainable uh, technologies and how we wish to, with our product offering, how we wish to uh, contribute to the sustainable, develop, further development of sustainable technologies. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Heidi. You might take a seat from the panel. So we continue okay. with the discussions when we are through with the first introductions. All right, thank you. Then I would like to introduce our second speaker, Mikael Hannus, uh, Vice President Biomaterials from Stura Enso. He has been working in different positions within Stura Enso since 97. His tasks, tasks within the biomaterials uh, include technology scouting, investments, R&D network building. As the representative of Stura Enso, Mr. Hannus is the chairman of the board of Inventia AB and Wallenberg Wood Science Center. Hence, very, very good connections to R&D, which is of importance today. So, Mr. Hannus, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you for the kind introduction and thank you for the invitation to the academic summit. I'm not very academic. I'm not at all academic. And let's see how how this plays out then, but uh, maybe I can uh, get this, this one to work. Uh, so, I feel a good industrial connection with what uh, the previous speaker uh, presented. Just to refresh your memory about the, the long industrial history of, of the company I'm working for, we have operations, we had operations about a thousand years ago in the mining field, copper mining. We have the oldest dated company document that is saved in our archive with the year 1288 written on it. That was a shared transfer signed by the bishop in Uppsala uh, regarding shares in the copper mine in Falun, mid, middle Sweden. And we have, since mid-1800, uh, been going into the biomass-based industry, sawmilling, uh, pulping, paper making. So we have been through some transformation rounds. And uh, we are on the, on the way into the next very big transformation round. And uh, the, simple, the simple structure of, of the company today is uh, we are very heavy in renewable packaging materials, printing papers, 
wood products and cellulose fiber to different uses. Based on this, we are going to transform into new areas and based on the history we have some capabilities already in the company but we are lacking a lot of capabilities that we are building and acquiring right now and this transformation is not to be done in one year or five years it will take more time but also uh, really one of the of the big Big reasons for this is that uh, the profitability in this bulk product industry today, which is forest products industry, uh, the profitability is far too low. And we, we think we have uh, a possibility to step by step take us into to the next uh, businesses where we can earn the right to live and reward the shareholders and the employees in a fair way. Uh, based on renewable materials, uh, renewable sources, recyclable sources, uh, recyclable products to a certain extent, and uh, I will come back to a little bit more the philosophy in how we think about the sustainable technologies. Uh, but if we are looking at where we are focusing our transformation path, it is into non-food competing biomasses, uh, which are built up, the basket is built up of sustainably harvested forest biomass, uh, recycled biomasses and other non-food biomasses also uh, improving the, the biomass efficiency of other value chains. For example, food value chain residuals can very well be a very important feedstock. And that is a part of the sustainability <coughs> heritage that we want to build on and be very efficient in utilizing the material. And there is a lot of science needed to, be, uh, to, to uh, crack the nuts that are preventing the material and energy efficient uses of biomasses, certain biomasses today, and convert them to uh, valuable uh, molecules. So, uh, bioeconomy value creation for us has to be built on a very efficient use. Be it then the raw material, be it then the inputs in terms of chemicals or energy or water, that is also a, an area where we are uh, having cooperation project with Chemira, for example, in China, uh, to really manage water intake. But, as one example on how we are looking in our existing industry and what regulation in a uh, distant country, a uh, big country called Brazil, 10 years ago we started to, to uh, implement a world-class chemical pulp mill based on eucalyptus plantation in southern Bahia. The environmental permit uh, regulations there states that we have to discharge our effluent into the river upstream our intake of water from the river. So we have basically to be comfortable with what we discharge in terms of effluent that will hit us back in some hours. And that is a very good uh, fostering idea uh, that really drives uh, responsibility with what you put back to the nature from your plant. You have to be able to cope with it yourself in a very, very short time. That is one example 
what, we, what kind of environment we are living in with our new meals around the world. So, where is then the, the, the great future in, in bio-based products and what kind of uh, processes will take us there? In order to meet all these challenging questions and understand what we should do, we have tried to select some basic principles to work along as of now. And I can give you a couple of examples on, on how we, we try to, to evaluate what should we do, what kind of processes are sustainable enough and also competitive enough in the short to medium to long run. So, for example, regarding uh, making uh, carbohydrates or uh, hydrocarbons, we think that starting from biomass where the second biggest part is oxygen is a somewhat challenging task. So we prefer to at least carefully look for the opportunities where we can retain the oxygens to a fairly high uh, degree in order to save on, on uh, raw material uh, losses because there is certain characteristics that when you try to get brutally rid of, of the oxygen you, you tend to lose quite much carbon also depending on the processes. But And the other thing is with the emergence of shale gas and decrease in natural gas prices in the world, we are not particularly focused on C1 and C2 products. Okay, if, they, if the C2 contains fairly much oxygen, it might be good still, but we, we try to position ourselves from C4 and upwards that is not excluding all the C2s and C3s, but it definitely uh, cuts out the bulk products there. And we don't... Now I'm jumping into my technology scout role. Uh, we try to understand that uh, it's very seldom you find a new technology concept that is going from nature through the processing conversion, value adding, end product market back to nature. Uh, that is excellent from the beginning. We try to understand what kind of changes, compromises, adjustments uh, we need to put together. So technology parts from different uh, excellence centers or research groups, professors, to combine them in a different way. So really to, to build what is unique. Uh, if I simplify it a lot and say many, many inventors and, and very good researchers have uh, one or two breakthrough uh, components in, in a bio-based uh, value chain. But unfortunately, there is too often many bad compromises, both before and after the golden nuts. So we think winning in the bio-based industry and being able to, to come up with the uh, sustainable technology concepts require that we, we dare to differentiate. And we cannot only trust what we know today from, from pulp and paper side. We have to take brave steps outside this when we target different industries, totally different products. For, take one example, if we want to become active in the food and nutrition businesses, we cannot build that alone on our capabilities to provide uh, 
fiber-based packaging material for food packaging. That is, it might, it might to our, our board colleagues, uh, fiber board colleagues or, or packaging board colleagues, sounds like it's very close, but it's very distant in reality. So uh, having spent only 0.6-0.7% of sales on R&D historically, we firmly believe that we have to lift this significantly, at least for our division, the biomaterials division in Storain. So this will be step by step, in large steps, increased uh, from this year to next year and the coming, coming years to, to be on a level that is four, four or five times higher than, than what we have spent the past years. And I hope that we can engage on an early stage, in a mid-term stage, or intermediate stage, and in the final stages with, with uh, different research programs in order to, to reach the, the targets. And that was the introduction. Thank you very much for the, for the introduction. Uh, then I would like to introduce our third speaker and panelist today. He comes from Neste Oil, Lars Peter Lindfors, uh, Senior Vice President on Technology. Uh, Lars Peter joined Neste Oil in 2007 and he's responsible for research and development, ICT procurement, investment management and business processes. Quite a lot. Uh, previously uh, you have served as a Vice President Technology and Strategy and as a vice president for company's research and development unit and in several other managerial uh, positions. Uh, very recently, uh, Lars Peter Lindfors has, been, has received the Energy Initiative of the Year Award and in 2014 he was recognized with the 2014 CTO of the Year Reward. So I welcome you as, as, as a distinguished speaker and, and I give you the floor on, on, on the introduction of Neste Oil. Thank you Marita for the kind introduction and thank you to the Aalto University for giving me the opportunity to be here today to talk about or a short briefing about Neste Oil and sustainable, sustainable technologies, which really are a key element of our strategy. And I would just like to start by saying that I, I came from a, a conference in Germany a couple of weeks ago where all the oil refining companies basically worldwide were gathered. And, and that was one, again, one of those exercises when I came home, I felt very happy to be in Neste Oil because in our industry, seriously, we are very much forward looking. And uh, that is the reason that we really see that uh, uh, renewable uh, energy is, is a key core area of our uh, company for the future. Just quickly about the company, we are a refining and marketing company uh, focused on premium quality products. Uh, fuels uh, as it is today, but I will in my last slide tell you a little bit more what our future looks like. Uh, we are refining some 15 million metric tons of crude oil every year into refineries in Finland, but then we also are refining um, two and a half million tons as is of today of renewable feedstocks, turning them into renewable fuels in Singapore, Rotterdam and in Finland. We are today the largest company in Finland in the stock market, if you measure the net sales, 17.5 billion euros. Last year's uh, EBIT was 604. We are active in 15 countries, some 5,000 people as employees. And uh, we are uh, owned by the Finnish state to 50.1% as the company is considered as a strategic company for the country. So. <clears throat> Why we are in this uh, sustainable uh, world, it's really because of our vision, which is setting the direction. We have been working for decades already to provide cleaner solutions for traffic and for end consumers. We are also in the retail business, so we have some 1,500 gas stations in the Baltic Rim, and we are very aware, well aware about what the consumers need. They need high quality products, environmentally preferred products, which do not have hiccups, even if it's cold weather. And uh, with this has been the, the red thread throughout the development of the company. And now with the new feedstock base in renewables, we are also entering into the renewable fuels. 
The drivers for the renewable fuels, the main drivers, of course, are to combat the climate change. Maybe you know that the transportation sector is uh, re has resulting in almost half of the carbon dioxide emissions in the globe. So this is a big fish to catch to decrease the, uh, the, the uh, emissions from the, from the traffic. And of course, we also, as we are a, a crude oil force uh, refining company, we still say that we work now towards the future where we reduce society's dependency on crude oil. So that's how we, we go into this business. And what, the, what this has led to today, as I mentioned, most of the refining companies in the world are not yet very active in this area. It has led to the fact that we are now the leading uh, provider of, of renewable diesel, high quality diesels to the world. We started this business in 2007 as a totally new uh, business unit in the company from zero in earnings and revenues. And last year, this new business uh, stood for almost half of our profits, that is almost 300 million euros in profits and 2.5 billion euros in uh, sales. The customers are choosing the product because it is sustainable and it has very high quality. It is actually of higher quality than the fossil high quality grade diesel. So here a little bit like what Heidi was talking about, the products also must be performing well. They cannot just be renewable. They also have to have a quality added value. We have a strong position in several European countries, the Nordic countries, Germany, but also very much so in, in the US and California, which are to be considered as different countries in the energy sector and also Canada. Last year's sales of, of renewable diesel for us uh, means 4.8 million tons avoided greenhouse gas emissions. And if we calculate it as 100% renewables used in cars, it, would may, it, it ends up to 2.6 million cars with renewable fuel. So it's more than half, for instance, of, the, of all cars in Finland would be running on these volumes that we produced last year. So this is big business for us. However, today in the world, we are producing about 75% of all renewable diesel. So this is a challenge that we have because there are, is need for more competition. And of course, to solve these carbon dioxide emission challenges, we need more players in the field. What I would like to talk, because I understand the theme of the today is a little bit the research to industry. Uh, if we take the learnings from our journey in the renewable business, from the scratch, when we started to make the research 20 years ago, our first patent is filed in 1996 in this field. To today's business, there are three main areas, I think, where we have been lucky and succeeded and worked hard with through the years. First, it's the capability to be innovative, which is, of course, a product of networks. It is the willingness to take the risks and think big. You shouldn't aim for second best, you must believe in what you do, uh, take risks and think big. And also then the third and most important thing is to work hard. Work hard and work hard and make sure that you get the right competencies, as Mikael was saying about Sturains also, looking for, for uh, competencies that you don't have. For instance, it was in the beginning of the journey, Nestoil didn't have very many biochemists in the house or algae researchers. Of course not. So we have to find the networks and maybe recruit some, some people with new competencies. Not to, to mention, uh, 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 for instance, sustainability issues, which are extremely important. So innovation, we have some 5,000 people in the corporate. Out of these 5,000, some 700 work in our engineering company, Neste Jacobs, together with the 300 people in R&D, 20% of our people are working with technology. And this is, of course, a key, key importance for us. One reason for this is that we are not having any oil fields. The oil majors get most of their profits from selling the oil from their oil fields. So the only way for us to get the margin is to buy cheap uh, fuels and refine them to high quality products. So that is very much technology. And that's what has driven us. We work a lot with a number of universities, 
institutes, companies, some 25 at the moment, uh, expanding the renew raw material basis key and also several products that we have put on the market, for instance, the renewable diesel, the biojet fuel, renewable jet fuel that we are using with Lufthansa, and uh, the last product we just launched was the biopropane, biogas produced in Rotterdam. Okay, risks, thinking big. <coughs> Uh, 1.5 billion euros in investments is a lot for our company, which is still a fairly small company in our industry. It has been a big risk. The second big risk has been to enter into a regulatory driven business because biofuels are, almost, are more expensive to produce than fossil fuels. So it's a regulatory business. And it has meant that we have been, uh, been forced to prioritize away from some other things we would have liked to do because we simply don't have resources for everything. Sustainability is absolutely core for us and that is an area where we have worked very much. If you are not uh, world class in sustainability, you cannot work in these kind of businesses. And uh, we have got a lot of positive recognition for our work in sustainability all the way from tracing our feedstocks and, uh, and setting the, the bar high for also other companies. We have worked very hard with feedstock, broadening the feedstock range. We started with crude palm oil. Today, 70% almost of our feedstock is waste and residue based. Here is a list you can see some of those. All of these are used in commercial scale. The biggest are the waste animal fat and waste fat from fish product processes. That is the, the largest part of our feedstock today. Used cooking oil is the last one that is becoming big as well. So this is a lot of work. And in the next phase, we see that we would like to see more of forestry agricultural residues to be used. But we will discuss this, I believe, in a while. There are some big challenges in that field. We have to solve them. So. R&D is, is needed a lot to broaden the feedstock base and our uh, target is to by 2017 have the availability and capability to process 100% waste and residue feedstocks to produce these renewable fuels. Uh, on top of this, uh, in the product side, we are also looking at broadening our customer base into bioplastics, for instance, into solvent and, and lube companies, that is, we are going to enter into renewable chemicals as well. As our product, you can say, see it as a, a very pure aliphatic, isomerized aliphatic hydrocarbon that can be used, for instance, in fuels, but also in the chemical industry. So I think we have a very interesting future ahead of us with broadening the feedstock base and broadening the customer base as well. So thank you very much. We have now heard uh, three somewhat different, but also, I would say, uh, top uh, presentations that do have a common foundation. So first about Chemira on corporate responsibility, about creating more sustainable products, which are safe. Um, then about Stura Enzo rethinking, how to transfer the, to, to the business into renewable materials. So quite a shift in, in the operations and understood that it takes a while. And then a sort of more practical uh, outcome already, really seeing that, that how to produce in practice biofuels that already create earnings as of today. So just to show that we are not talking about something that is somewhere only in the distant future, but we are talking about business opportunities that are there today. It's about thinking big and, and being able to seize them. What I kind of tried to summarize here that, that all of these three, three talks and, and, and companies and even one of our own from Valmet, we are really see, trying to see that how can we enable the global economic growth without risking the sustainable future. So it is about finding the right balance when we think about the vastly growing population out of which 75% will be in, in Asia, uh, more and more will be in urbanized areas, meaning that there's a, a lot of pressure on all of our, our resources. And, and we will see uh, more pressure also on, on global warming, clean, how to get clean air and fresh water to everybody. Um, out of the water, 75% goes for growing food. 
but we also need water in processing, we need water in, in, pro, in, in power production, so water is one of the, the core issues. And also uh, it came about in the, in the last speak, uh, topic, uh, topic of the talk that, that we are very dependent on fossil fuels and we really need to find alternatives to the fossil fuels. And then we come into this sort of mingled play with all these different resources that how do we secure arable land, how do we best use the biomass and different residues and waste materials. And I think that we saw examples on, on all of these different areas already now. So this is a very broad, broad and, and big challenge that, that we are all, all, all addressing here. And, and since the topic of our session is really to, to think about the, the sustainable technology, what I would like you to reflect on first that, that what is really the role of technology in, in this development when going towards bioeconomy or circular economy and, and how big a share of, of the challenge is on entirely different matters. Somebody volunteers to start? <laughs> I can start. Okay. I see technology as the major driver. Uh, much, much more long-term sustainable driver than whatever policies will do. I'm afraid that uh, Political decisions, uh, regulation is far too often, as we have seen in the history, uh, sub-optimizing the area uh, for inefficient uses to reach fairly short-term targets and uh, overlooking the breakthroughs from, needed from technology because they take time. And in a uh, political climate where you have four or six, year, uh, six years between the elections, there is certain pressure to show, show the voters what has been achieved in a very short time. And uh, I have been working a lot in the energy area before I, I came over to biomaterials and biorefining. And, uh, in that area, I see quite some sad things uh, because it also spills over to, to a challenge that has been touched in this, in this panel and in the previous one, that uh, very suitable uh, biomass for, for, uh, or areas for high volume uh, good quality biomass is to, to uh, really serve the big leaps in the bioeconomy and, and, and this development. There are not so many sweet spots around and these get, have become fewer and fewer with, with some past fairly unjustified subsidies. Okay, thank you. Lars-Peter? Yeah, uh, yeah, I think uh, technology is, is uh, at, at the core of the challenges. Uh, first of all, I would like to say that the, the oil and uh, gas situation of the world is such that there will be plenty around for a very, very long time, which means that, that financially we need to find more efficient way to utilize the biomass of the world in order to also make it sustainably in a financial per, from a financial perspective. And I think that algae oils, algae development and also uh, utilization of forestry and agricultural wastes, that is where we need some real breakthrough innovations from technology in order to make them more cost competitive. I think this is a necessity if we want to really replace uh, the, the, the crude oil world with renewables. We, we must realize that there is limited amount of feedstock today in the biomass. Just a short comment still. If you take the Finnish situation, for instance, we should not, by the way, look at raw material locally. We should look at them also globally. But if we take the Finnish perspective and we see all the annual growth of forest in Finland and take away the amount that is already used by industry, in theory, all the rest of the forest that grows in a year is comparable to about 35% of the fuel that we use in Finland in one year. So you understand that there is, there is a limitation to how much biomass there is around. And that means that we really must make sure that we utilize 
it efficiently and develop new biomass, make it grow faster and have it as a global, uh, global approach. Thank you very much, Lars Peter. Heidi, please. Well, I see the role of technology as being an enabler. I think one thing is that it allows us to create new solutions. Uh, and we certainly need much more efficient ones to be able to utilize the biomass, whatever is available, or let's say waste streams uh, today. But secondly, I would also say that um, as part of the change today is driven by the regulation, or let's say at least supported, it's there before the regulation to step in, there needs to be some sort of a technological solution available because no politician is going to probably propose a, a change in the laws and regulations unless there is a, some sort of a solution available. So it has a twofold role, but it certainly will be an enabler to make the change. Thank you. I think that there was a very good consensus that, that our topic is extremely current and in the core of the change. Um, then I, I think that it would be good to, to, to address a little bit. There was already things like uh, we need breakthrough innovations. And, and if I sort of quote a couple of things what some other companies have said about what are the characteristics of breakthrough innovations, uh, need to be comfortable with uncertainty, very resourceful in, in getting things accomplished, adapt very quickly as circumstances change, and not letting any standard processes be on the way. So it, it requires quite some persistent and, 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 and open approach. And, and it, it would be nice if you could elaborate a little bit on how do you see the role of uh, basic, uh, basic research like that from the universities and the, the, the like open innovation when you think of technologies that, that are being developed in your, in your companies? Heidi, you would like to start? Okay. <laughs> Well, I see that there's a clear role, let's say, at least the way we see it in, in Chemira is that we certainly want to collaborate with the university, want, want to have them have a role, especially in the basic research. Uh, we can't do everything. We can't even have persons who would know everything. So we certainly want to um, have a number of external partners, collaborate with them, allow there to be, let's say, um, and encourage them for more, being probably a little bit more creative and, and open and coming up with new technologies. Of course, we are trying to do a part of that ourselves as well. But today with the, let's say, um, resource limitations, it's, it's just not possible. Mm -hmm. And we need more people a different type of thinking as well yeah, and good. new knowledges. Yeah, excellent. How about Mikael? Yep, I continue immediately on that. Uh, as I said also in, in the introduction, we dare to be different. Uh, and uh, I think previous session mentioned the one really critical uh, object or, or hurdle in the interaction between industry and, and uh, basic research university, universities and so on. Uh, and that is the ability to ask the right question, formulate the right question, and really get to the point of what needs to be researched and what kind of competence, knowledge has to be built in order to be able to answer to, to the trends that we want to, to jump on. So instead of uh, following what is debated in public uh, or what is screamed about uh, uh, in, in the politics, uh, we have to really take the step back, be humble and go, go to our professors and start to understand which are the basic things that we are still lacking understanding of in order to be able to make the next breakthrough. And that also understand that that will not be the only breakthrough mm -hmm. that we need. We need always to get to the next one and then identify what is still needed, but we have to build it 
And coming, coming to, to, to the example of, of Lars Peter also there to take them into commercial mm. applications. So we are not always uh, trying then to always reach the, the uh, definite tutti, tutti solution that everything is solved with one single implementation. That will not fly. Thank you. Lars Peter, something you would okay. like to add there to this innovation network? There was quite a lot of network? comments, but uh, yes. <laughs> I think that there is a, we, need, we need two kinds of cooperation with, with uh, universities. Firstly, I think it's very important that we still improve the way we work together in industrially relate, related research. That means that we understand how to ask the right questions and mm -hmm. to work together. But I would also challenge the industry and say that we probably not always have all the radically best new ideas. So I think it's a very important part of university work that with the education system that we have, that we make sure that we also have deep specialists available to work in, in, in let's say, uh, radical ideas out of the box, like uh, Professor Ikala was saying also. I think that is also important. There needs to be both because some of the challenges of today, when they are being solved in many universities, like for instance the uh, fractionation of, of, of lignocellulosics. I mean, so many places do exactly the same research and I would challenge that also. Why not try something new, something really new? And there I would like to, to see the universities uh, provided there is funding for this, which is mm. another discussion. Yeah. But there should be some funding also for doing some in-depth uh, radical research, which is different kind than the university corporations. Mm. Thank you. I think that, that that's, this sort of brought back nicely to the, to the discussion that was also in the earlier panel when we talked about that what are the differences between the university-driven research mm. and, and then the research in the business world. And one of the, the adjectives brought into the discussion was that uh, university R&D is driven by curiosity. And I think that this curiosity is very strongly uh, bound to this out-of-the-box thinking and radical ideas and having a certain element of freedom which you cannot have when you are mm. working in, in, a, in a business environment where you need to bring the bottom line result that is, that is necessary for the business. Mm. And, and then I think that one of the challenges then is to how to bring these two ends together because yes. they are fairly far off from each other so that you can create a common language and common understanding of what, what does it really take to move forward. And one of the, 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 the sort of challenges that we all always have is that we don't have that deep pockets with, with a huge amount of funds. But very much related to this topic, what I would also like to discuss with, with, with you today has to do with another thing that was brought up in the earlier discussion. We talked about the role of startups and, 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 and how could they contribute to the development. And at least when looking at it from the Valmet perspective and thinking of technology scouting as, as, uh, as Mikael is also having part of his job, I think that, that utilizing better these small companies which are specializing in certain areas, we could also make uh, some kind of step change in the, in the development. And it would be very good to hear from your side that, that how do you see this kind of collaboration with startups and, and small companies in, in, in taking your technology development forward and when transforming your business into, into the new arenas. Maybe Heidi, you can start, so we go in the order. Uh, let's say we have some very, very good examples, some very successful examples of working with, um, let's say, very small companies. But um, the challenge is always to find the right partner. There's, um, let's say, um, lots of companies that approach us and with the expectation that um, we would either, let's say, um, either acquire them or they have, most often they have one product or, or uh, we would just invest there readily. And quite often it, it means that um, the timeline thinking is probably somewhat different. Of course, the small one has to, they have to survive mm -hmm. and they have to get their product out in the market very quickly. Whereas for us, it's probably something that is an addition on our product portfolio. And that means that we need to develop some further, further offering together and, and to make it the real product for us. And then sometimes the patience is, is or, the, or the money is not there. Yes. 
But on the other hand, uh, we have certainly found um, companies where we have been able to go out of box slightly, sometimes with a little bit of difficulties, but certainly finding areas where we can utilize some knowledge that we don't have in house. And we have found a very good partner, for example, in, let's say, in sensor technology and mm -hmm. control and monitoring, which is an additional service that we could offer to our customers. Um, and that is not our own core competence. It's certainly adjacent. We need it, but it's not something that we have in-house. Mm. So the partnering, finding the right partner is, that's the key thing. <laughs> Sounds like a familiar problem. <laughs> yeah, <Mikael? laughs> yeah uh, definitely finding the right partners, but also there to, to fail. That is what we have to, to learn to do more. Fail fast mm. if it's the wrong partner. And uh, we have made two little startup or investments into startups. Too few of them and uh, we have had too much discussion regarding the failures. And uh, it might very well be, be uh, due to the corporate culture that is very controller intense. Risk averse. Risk averse and, and whatever investments you do, you tend to have the uh, starting point that this is something that will run as it is when started up for 30 years. And that is not the characteristic of, of an investment into a startup company. Mm -hmm because uh, there will be a lot of evolving uh, new parts. Uh, even basic technology changes may, may be needed. Uh, and then, then you are kind of jumping out of the, of the investment governance right after the investment. And it's, it's very, uh, very difficult to, to make these, even if, if the money is not, too big, but you have made a commitment to the board of directors, to the CEO, that this is what we believe in, and then you, will, you want to make changes. And that is something we have to learn to do. We have a very, very strong support in, in taking these steps, going into this type of transformation uh, investments via startups, via licensing new technologies into the company. <coughs> We have a very strong support from the board of directors and the CEO, but we dare to execute the freedom we have been given also. Hmm. But that's good to hear that there's quite a lot of activity ongoing, so that's very good news for the small startups. Lars Peter, would you like to add something? Yeah, I think from a, from a let's say, a bigger picture, like a national economical picture, I think it's very important, especially in this country, that we educate the students also, those who are interested in this in entrepreneurial skills and that they are willing to start their own businesses. Uh, so I'm very happy with this connection between the universities and startups. And then we need to bring into this also the larger enterprises into this, this whole picture. Uh, one personal view though is that I wouldn't recommend the universities to be owners of these startups. They should be providers and enablers, maybe for facilities and things like that. And that way support uh, this kind of development. Uh, so I think also, as you can see from this uh, big slush event, I mean, there are a lot of things happening in, in, the, in the country and in the world that, that we really need to encourage people to, to come with new solutions. What comes to the, our company uh, in Estoil, I think it's, it's uh, quite, it, it is, Let's say it's good to get these uh, new ideas from the startup. Somehow it just needs to be fit together in a good way. And that is sometimes a, a little bit of a challenge because if you want as a big company to take in an idea from a smaller startup, you probably want to somehow buy the, buy the company and take it in. And that is also something that some entrepreneurship uh, real, uh, people have a challenge also to let go of their companies because it's so emotional. So yeah. there are different kind of smaller challenges, but I think the more of these startups there are around and the better we can link the universities, the startups and the bigger companies together, the more we will all win mm. from this. Mm. Mm. I fully agree. 
And I think that they are sort of, it's about the question of finding the right balance on, on, on how to combine the, the knowledge and, and how to do it in practice. Um, I was in Copenhagen in Innovation Roundtable just about a week ago. And one of the big companies was saying that uh, when you find a very, very genius small company, which is having a lot of freedom and they are just fantastically full of ideas, don't, don't ever just take them under your corporate culture and crush them down mm -hmm. because they will not be able to, to, to perform. Mm -hmm. So it is also about recognizing yeah. the differences and the different ways of operating and the differences, different motivators that, that are needed in, in this stage of development. And I think that sort of nicely brings us to the, to the topic that I wanted to talk about a little bit more, about the competencies that are needed, because that's very important for both for the teaching staff and, and for the students and for all of us, so that we are kind of ready for, for, for tomorrow and, 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 and have the right things to do. And also from the point of view that, that if we think of the technology development and there's the discovery phase when you need to create something, that usually requires quite some different skills and mindset than the following wage, which is more about incubation on how do you take it forward. And then even more different skill sets when you think about the acceleration part, when you really want to commercialize. So what would you sort of like to, to, to give as a takeaway to this audience in terms of the competencies that you see that are important now when transferring your business into these new areas of bio and transferring it to the new materials and sustainability plays, a, plays an even stronger role. And then we already heard that entrepreneurship and a lot of other things comes, come, come, comes tangled into this equation because at some point it might be a little bit overwhelming that what should we do then, what should we have? to be desired employees. Katie? I guess, um, well, to start with that, I guess we need, in the future, we need both very specific experts, but we also need generalists. So it's, it's both ways. Of course, in the science, you, we would appreciate the very, very, let's say, a specific, knowledgeable persons who are real experts in certain areas. But then it's, it's hard to say what the areas exactly will be in the next 5 to 10 to 15 years. But and then on the other hand, we also need the, the um, let's say, the generalist. I would say one which is a key thing is the right attitude. Realizing that the world is changing all the time, we need to keep on learning. Whenever I graduated from the university, I don't know how much of that I've used, but uh, maybe some of it, <laughs> hopefully. <laughs> but anyway, it's, it's, you keep, need to keep on learning all the time. Be, try to be as open-minded as possible and uh, realize that it's never going to be enough. Yeah, second that 100%. <laughs> Mikael? I think competencies and capabilities can be defined in many ways, but we should not forget the role of the personality of the people that we are hiring and understanding how these personalities complement each other. Of course, it has to be a very, very solid basic education. Uh, then there is a scale between generalists and, and, and very, very deep specialists. That is also guided how they fo the persons focus mm. their brain. Mm. And that comes to the personality. personality yes. yes. And uh, I think for our needs in Stora Enzo, uh, we need to, to uh, acquire competencies and experience at this point in one package in order to build, build the, the, the structure uh, for then adding on the freshmen to gain the critical mass. So we, cannot, we have not the capabilities in-house today to develop the people enough. We have to acquire that external competence <clears throat> that we are lacking, who then attracts new fresh blood and develop the, these youngsters or, or uh, almost youngsters. <laughs> they tend to graduate later and later now. Oh, but maybe not so <laughs> youngsters anymore. <laughs> Thank you, Mikael. Lars Peter? Yeah, I think I, I would like to 
exp or what I would like to see from the universities in the future as, as uh, the, the producing the, the skillful people of tomorrow, uh, two parts. First is the substantial knowledge. I mean, that is really that, as I, I tend to say at home to my three boys also when they are starting to study, that, that I would recommend them to, to learn something really well. So that they are really good in something substantially uh, in, a, in a substance form. Because you can always become a generalist, mm -hmm. but it's very difficult to become a specialist if you are or a generalist from the start. I have, for instance, become a generalist, <laughs> but I, I, I was quite, uh, quite uh, in depth into certain areas before. The second is then the emotional intelligence or social skills, because that is the key point. In, the, in the the, the, today's world and the future, it is so that we don't work according to the traditional industry borders, like we have seen today clearly with, for instance, the pulp and paper industry changing totally. And, and our industry as well. So we need people who are capable of working and understanding that they need to work and share their information with others, with other knowledge pe knowledgeable people. Then, of course, uh, it's important to be curious mm -hmm. and to, be, to dare to challenge also what is there today. So curious people who are willing to challenge, who are very easy to work with other people and, and who are really good in certain areas. That's what I would like to say. Mm -hmm. That sounds really good. And I, th I, I, I have to confess that one of the reasons why I love this area is so much that I'm so curious that I want to learn something every day. <laughs> and that has not stopped and I hope that it will never stop because that's really the kind of fuel that keeps us going. I thought that we could sort of uh, go, go closer towards closing this general discussion before we give the floor mm -hmm. to the audience. And it would be nice to end up with something a little bit more visionary on how do you see the future? Where do you see your company in 2025, uh, in 2030? That, that what kind of a path do you think you are paving? I mean, I can start because I, I put this big question on your, on, on, in front of you. So my dream would be that that Palmet really is taking the industry forward. That we are supporting our, our traditional customers in, in pulp paper and, and, and energy. And we are bringing all these new technologies. But not only that, but we are also making, making, making entry to totally new customer sectors that, that open up our minds and, 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 and views to, to, to thinking in a different manner, doing business in a different manner, new business models, and really becoming the global leaders also in some of those new areas like biomass fractionation or, or specific process technologies which fit extremely well to our present portfolio and we really can provide something unique and, and special. So that's one of my dreams to, to, to be able to grow in an area like this. How do you see your companies like going forward towards 2030? Maybe Heidi you can start so we go in nicely in order. I would say that uh, we utilize better the, let's say we, we, we should get substantially better in utilizing the, what today we may call, let's say, waste or size streams. And uh, we get more into this recycling mm -hmm. business. And well, let's say, let make it, make it a business. And um, can really support, like, not just utilize the thinking in our own, own uh, operations, but really support the, let's say, the world become better in that sense, mm -hmm. supporting our customers doing that. And I would like to see that happening in every part of the, the business and every part of the organization as well. So really taking it, let's say, making it all over. Sounds good. Mika? I think 2025 is quite close. It is quite yes. close. And uh, that means that the vision for, for such a short time period has to be very much based on current mm -hmm. research and uh, actually applied research. It cannot even be basic research because then it, it's not upscaled and commercialized. And, uh, but despite this, I, I'm convinced that we will have quite a sizable uh, business, profitable business directed towards new segments, like what, what I uh, uh, indicated. Maybe food and nutrition is a substantial part. Uh, also home and personal care. Uh, 
adhesives, coatings, uh, which are adjacent to, to what, where we are today, basically. And uh, uh, certain uh, business lines also in uh, specialty chemicals. Hmm. Let's get back to that on 2025. Lars Peter, please. Okay, so <clears throat> if we talk about 2030, I think that our company is double the size of today. We are a very global player. Uh, we have been somehow active and part of the solution to making it possible to utilize a very much broader range of bio, bio uh, feedstocks. And uh, we are growing our business in uh, areas of renewables, both in the fuel sector, but also in the chemical sector and some specialty advanced products. Sounds really good. I think that we have big, 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 we are thinking big as we should. We should be dreaming even bigger because then actually we start getting there. And that's a very good start. Uh, now I would like to give the, the, the possibility for questions to the audience, please, if somebody would walk with the microphone. And it would be nice if you say who you are and what, are you what uh, organization you are representing and then state your question, please. Uh, hi, uh, I'm uh, Dawei, a doctoral student uh, in Arto University, major in material science. Uh, I will defend my dissertation next Friday, so welcome to attend. <laughs> <laughs> Congratulations. Uh, uh, my question is, uh, is uh, because all of you come from the big companies in Finland, uh, my question is, uh, is that uh, big company make uh, some uh, making some wrong dis decision so that we need such uh, a lot of uh, entrepreneurs even in the university thank you hmm. okay, last bit, yeah. okay. I, I think that uh, we need all kinds of different kind of companies, big companies, small companies, sometimes they work together. But I think that sometimes the, there is a risk that if we want really radical ideas, mm -hmm. it can be challenging to find them in the big companies. So I think it's always important that there are small companies also around. When you say that uh, 2.6 million cars are now fueled by your renewable energy, what is that renewable energy main that you are using now? It's the re it's, uh, so it's used, we are using different kind of renewable feedstocks, like such as, for instance, the waste streams from the slaughtery houses, that is fatty acids of different kind, that we convert into hydrocarbons. Uh, so it's aliphatic chain, hydrocarbon chains, which we isomerize so we get high quality uh, pr uh, quality fuels, and that is then used. So that is what we are doing. And, yeah, how much does that cost, per, let's say, per gallon compared well, to normal gas? Yeah, of course, it's an interesting question, but uh, I would say so that uh, between the, let's say, roughly 20% more than fossil fuels. And how much energy does it take to okay. make this conversion? Yeah. Well, it's not, it's, not a, it's not a bad equation. I, I can't by heart remember the figures, but of course we have looked into this and all the, very much into the carbon dioxide emissions and things like that from well to wheel and things like that. And, and your ma main original material is what? And Animal fat. How do you get rid of the waste products? Uh, we, animal? Animal fat. We don't have any, almost any waste at all. Because we, use, we used um, lipids. We use lipids from e either from the uh, animal, animals or, 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 or plants, fatty acids, and then we convert those. So we actually, we have hardly any, any, any kind of uh, uh, waste. So this is not a, a biodiesel, this is not an ester product, where you have methanol and, and trust, transesterify. This is not there, you get glycerol. Yeah, well, we are using today almost 3 million tons of starting material, 2.5 million tons of starting material. 
That is what I showed in my picture with those 11 different kind of feedstocks, which is used cooking oil, for instance, is what we are using quite a lot now also. Further questions? Okay, if not, uh, then I would uh, thank all of our panelists and speakers. Thank you very much. Thank you. Interesting discussion, and then I would like to give the floor to, to President of Alto University, Tula Teri, please. Yes, thank you very much uh, for everybody for very uh, interesting discussions. We have been discussing uh, for about three and a half days in different uh, uh, configurations about the role of universities uh, uh, for economic growth, we said in the beginning, but then we have also been questioning at some point of our discussions whether growth is actually desirable, you know, so I don't actually really know what the conclusion on that one is. But at least, you know, for the generation of uh, well-being in the society or improving, making a world a better place, whether that is then through economic growth or by other means, but I think it uh, uh, is a shared goal, goal uh, for many of us. We have been discussing uh, the role of universities sort of like a, a catalytic force or catalyzing a change and, and, and the degrees of change that had been asked from us uh, has been, has been uh, quite radical, <laughs> I can say, uh, from changing, changing uh, industry, you know, changing uh, society. And I think the worst, uh, the, the most challenging one was at some discussion that changing the government. <laughs> so <laughs> there are clearly very, very big uh, demands on universities. Um, also, uh, I think that, you know, also from your discussion, it was very clear that sort of new knowledge and new technologies is something that, that is desired. And also that it's very important that we give our students not just uh, knowledge and facts and, and, and things like that during the education, but the kind of a curious mind and, 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 and the drive to, 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 to really be a change agent. And, and, and we are, of course, very much uh, working on along those, those lines. And also, I think it was really uh, uh, interesting how this entrepreneurship agenda has, has come, uh, come up in almost all of the discussions. Of course, we'd visit this last, you know, so we could sort of feel the enthusiasm of the young entrepreneurs. And, and I'm also very, very kind of happy to see that, you know, this is not uh, actually owning the companies or, or, or running the companies is not considered the role of universities because I agree completely that the companies should then stand on their own two feet. So, so, but, but we have clearly a role to, to create the, the kind of entrepreneurial culture that, that also that uh, the, the, our students feel like that entrepreneurship is also a career and, and, and then it can benefit the uh, society and the, the existing companies by creating something that might, might be difficult in a, in a large company. And so, so uh, also uh, for the university um, uh, industry collaboration, we had some uh, very interesting questions yesterday and discussions about uh, what is the best mode or way for, for university and, 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 and industry collaborate with each other. And I think uh, it was rather uh, a nice idea to say that, you know, uh, uh, the, the industries should not only think of themselves as funders of the collaboration, but partners in the way that uh, you can generate a common agenda with shared goals. And, and, and so that if both parties put quite a lot of actual manpower or women power, you know, effort into the collaboration, then the results are probably going to be mutually beneficial. And, and, and it's very clear uh, from all of the discussions that, that uh, at least in our kind of universities, we very much appreciate the collaboration from the industry because it does generate new questions. And you were also mentioning this, that, you know, we need to be able to ask the right questions, you know, so I think it's mutually inspiring to, to, to engage uh, in this kind of um, collaboration. So I th I'm, I'm really, myself, personally, really energized uh, about these discussions that we've had here for the three and a half days. Uh, we've gotten a lot of food for thought and also from the earlier discussion in the design session, I think now we all need to take some time for reflection <laughs> and we are all, all going to be so much wiser after we have thought about what we've learned through, during these three and a half days. 
So I really want to thank all the speakers, all the chairpersons who have taken their effort to, to catalyze these discussions, all of you participants, whether from Finland or from other faraway countries. I want to thank the World Cultural Council that gave us this inspiration uh, to organize this um, uh, uh, academic summit in connection with the award ceremony. I want to thank once again our own uh, event team for the excellent organization. And lastly, I want to thank our co-organizer, Citra, for the support for this event, our other co-organizer, World Cultural Council, for their support, uh, and our partners, the uh, Federation of Finnish Technology in Industries, Neste Oil, uh, Nokia, and Fortum, and Technology Academy of Finland. So thank you all very much. Let's give a, a final hand, and then I will tell what happens next.